Good afternoon, everyone. My name is C.B. Mamrill, and on behalf of the Systems for Action National Program Office here at the University of Kentucky College of Public Health, I would like to welcome everyone to today's PHSSR Research in Progress webinar, focusing on the cost, quality, and value of public health services. We have today an exciting topic on the cost and cost drivers of foundational public health services in Washington State and relationships with structural and community factors. So before we get started, I'd like to remind everyone that today's presentation is available for download, including speaker bios from the resources box in the top right corner of the screen. So just to give um, everyone an idea of the flow, we have a good number of participants today. The flow of our webinar will be as follows. I will first introduce our speaker, who will then give her presentation. And then we also have with us two commentators today, and I'll also introduce them to as well. Uh, and then they'll give their commentaries, and then after that, they'll we'll open the webinar to uh, questions. So um, even during the presentation, we encourage everyone that if you have questions, to uh, please go ahead and type it in the chat box, which is at the lower right corner of your screen. And uh, we will get to those questions uh, either during the uh, presentation or at the end of the commentary. So with that, it is my pleasure to introduce to you our speaker for today, Dr. Betty Beckemeyer, who is an associate professor at the University of Washington School of Nursing and also an adjunct associate professor at the University of Washington School of Public Health. Much of Betty's research and leadership in advancing public health systems has been conducted with a Washington State Public Health Practice-Based Research Network, as well as other state and the National Network of Public Health PBRN. Betty leads several PBRN-related research projects, and in particular, the Public Health Activities and Services Tracking Study, or FAST for short. FAST is an ongoing multi-state PBRN study to develop the evidence regarding health outcomes associated with variation and change in local public health infrastructure and service delivery. And with that, I would like to turn it over to you, Betty. All right, great. Thanks, CB. And um, you've got me here presenting, and of course you'll have our, um, our uh, practice and research commentators, but uh, this uh, takes a village, this kind of study, not the least of which is all of our practice-based research network colleagues. Um, but also my co-investigator, Justin Marlowe, um, and uh, research assistants, Cherie Squires and Sungun Park, who've been really instrumental in this whole endeavor. Uh, so thanks so much to everybody and to the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation for funding this uh, study I'll be talking about. Now this study is in the context of uh, practice-based research networks. So I think everybody's probably pretty familiar with those. Um, but it's also work that's very complementary to work being carried out in Washington State um, and where we're establishing, our practice colleagues are establishing a legislative act for ongoing, an ongoing level of funding for a foundation of public health services in every community, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, but, uh, but this practice-based research study I'm going to talk about today here in Washington is really helping to generate evidence that our, our state and, and national partners can use to inform um, discussions here in Washington and more broadly. Um, and many of our state and local public health leaders provided data for this study and helped interpret, interpret the meaning of the data for the study, so really uh, helping inform um, this, this research as well as ongoing um, statewide efforts, so it's really been a um, a partnership and very complementary to the research and the other work going on. Um, in a broader context, uh, most of you are probably familiar with this Institute of Medicine report um, that came out in 2012 and really laid the groundwork for a lot of what's happening now in these national discussions. Um, in Washington, some of this was going on uh, even prior to this report, but this report boldly kind of maligned our current lack of stable and consistent public health funding um, but just as important, the complex and extremely varied systems for allocating and assuring uh, consistent funding. So the report says that despite tremendous national efforts in the past decade, 
to advance performance, the efforts and effectiveness of our public health systems are profoundly misaligned. Um, so in, it's in that context um, that this uh, research was funded and is, 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 was made, put underway. Um, now as more attention is given to um, these issues, more, re more research is being conducted or in some respects, the research also helps drive the attention. So to me, I want to sort of point that out because that's kind of um, the advantage of having public health or these public health uh, practice-based research networks. They've really helped assure that the research is relevant and that the, um, the, the work is carried out and that it's driving national discussions. So some of our own research in Washington um, and other states' data demonstrated, for example, that reductions in for example, maternal child health expenditures by local health departments was occurring disproportionately in the communities with the highest poverty and need. So really um, uh, showing evidence of, uh, very dangerous evidence of this misalignment. And Glenn Mays and others have also um, articulated this around inefficiencies and dysfunction, um, including a, a, a work done by CB here and, and Glenn. Um, and that, uh, that have led public health activities to being really least visible and most poorly understood in our health system, uh, leading to uh, dysfunction and, um, and in fact harm, we think, we um, uh, expect to the public's health. So in the meanwhile, there's very little empirical evidence that currently exists concerning what economists and management scientists term, quote, the production functions for our public health services, our activities. So the mechanism through which inputs of time, money, labor, and information are transformed into programs and services and policies that protect the public's health. So it's in that context I'll be talking about this study. And this study was part of um, a national group of studies launched by RWJF in 2013, the Delivery and Cost Studies Program, we were affectionately refer to as DAX, um, and it provided funding for 11 public health PBRNs to estimate the cost of delivering public health services. And, and these studies examined how characteristics of delivery of these services and systems influence cost, quality, equity of public health service delivery. And these are some examples of some of the states that were included in the study. Now, I'll talk about Washington's, and I'm going to be focused on Washington's DAC study. So in Washington, um, the statewide foundational public health services work group, of which I am a member, but it's largely uh, um, state and local public health people. I think I'm the only academic on that work group, but that work group was tasked with developing a strategy to determine, quote, predictable and appropriate levels of financing, end quote. And uh, Washington's PBR and DAC study then leveraged those FPHS activities in Washington's practice to examine what factors pro promote and inhibit the provision of these services. So here's the framework for the foundational public health services. A lot of you are perhaps, or all of you might be familiar with this um, picture. And what we're talking about when we're, when we're talking about the Foundation of Public Health Services here in, in Washington and elsewhere is, um, are these, is within the red box. Now, um, in Washington, I think the Washington version of this is slightly different from the national one. Um, and we have six programs and six capabilities. I think vital records is um, pulled out separately for, for us here in Washington. But it's the same idea. Um, and these are uh, programs and capabilities that ought to exist everywhere for people to be healthy anywhere. Um, that's what we're focused on in this study in terms of looking at, at those costs and how they vary and what makes them vary. So in terms of our methods, it was, um, we used largely primary data collection. And um, uh, in, and in particular, um, we, most of our data we used for the study were those collected from this uh, FPHS cost estimation instrument that we developed. Now we developed it through um, modification of an instrument from P 
people may know the SASGAP in instrument, which is from um, uh, Substance Abuse Services. Uh, but we modified that, and um, the Washington State FPHS workgroup used an original version of this that they had modified and collected data in 2014, and then we modified that um, uh, quite a bit more and in collaboration with our practice partners um, to create it, this instrument that we use for this study. And it's used for developing cost function estimates and um, capture direct costs for, in particular, for FTE efforts on each activity within these capabilities and services. The survey had um, several tabs. It had instruction. One of the tabs was instructions. Another was a list of occupational definitions, the definitions for each of these programs and capabilities, and the definitions for things like um, non-labor expenses. So we had everybody kind of on the same page about that. Um, and then responses provided total, uh, respondents provided total FTE in each occupational category across the six foundational programs and six foundational capabilities. So, you know, you all know perhaps that public health budgets don't tend to break down FTEs among these specific um, activities. I'll go back to the FPHS again. Um, but so, for example, we might have asked a, um, uh, the person filling it out to take one of their registered nurses that may spend he or she may spend a quarter of their time focused on immunizations, maybe a quarter of time, a quarter of their time in assessment activities, and the remainder uh, providing community partnership development, something like that. And then they'd estimate those amounts of actual time spent in these different areas. Um, they'd also provide average total salary paid for each occupational category, including indirect expenses, et cetera. And through that, kind of capturing um, uh, these costs. Uh, so in terms of our sample, uh, we had ultimately had uh, 10 local health jurisdictions in our sample. And um, the selection criteria, uh, one of the first selection criteria was survey burden because we have um, we had some other work going on, and some of this, some of these, as I mentioned, these um, health departments were data, similar data were collected from these health departments in 2014. So we didn't, we wanted to go to a different set um, and not burn the same groups. Uh, we tried to get a rural, urban, metropolitan mix and size of population served. Was it a department or a district, standalone agency, et cetera? So all of these. Uh, were taken into account in our selection, um, and uh, and then based on this, ran our uh, selection um, uh, by our work, our advisory group, and um, confirmed that we invited 14 counties jurisdictions to participate, and 10 completed the uh, survey for a response rate of 71 percent, which was pretty good. It was a pretty onerous, big job for them to to do this work with us. Um, in terms of analysis, there are a lot of different things we could do with this data, and here are a few things we've done. Um, we combine the costs and um, expenditure data with selected local health jurisdiction services and measures from um, what we have in Washington is an activities and services inventory. It's um, it's similar to what uh, the when we when if you're familiar with the improved study and the improved measures or the fast improved measures whatever, it's really data around um, volume and reach et cetera of specific annual public health services that are delivered. So we had the advantage of being able to include these um, service delivery data, and uh, we use these data. I'll talk a little bit about that to develop a unit cost. So You've got those spending data plus um, uh, plus services. You can start to get at you know the cost of one um, such and such. The cost you have to produce one immunization given or one um, STD case followed or one septic tank inspected. 
um, which we've never been able to do that before um, or had the opportunity to really um, examine that. So we examine those unit cost estimates then too while controlling for our other um, contextual data. Uh, thereby looking at, you know, looking at then what explains variation in spending. Um, we'll also be doing, um, we've been uh, doing some multivariate panel regressions with unit costs for each of the foundational public health services and including a bunch of um, independent variables, which I'll talk a little bit about, but things like population, poverty, unemployment, so context of those communities and including a, um, the, and this is again with some encouragement from our practice partners who said, you know what really makes a difference is local politics in terms of what we're able to spend um, or uh, in our communities around these services. So what we did was um, not, uh, you know, it's easy to come by data around, uh, um, a county's voting patterns, Democrat or Republican for governor, for um, president, et cetera. But um, in Washington and perhaps elsewhere, there's, um, you know, we have um, um, spendy Republicans. We have, um, we have uh, uh, Democrats who are more, um, who are not big spenders uh, in terms of our population. Um, so instead, we wanted to use a more sensitive measure of um, kind of the sensibility of that community. And so we happened to have initiative in 2014, initiative 1351, was really about um, local communities taxing themselves to lower class size and increase school staffing um, and provide the funding that was necessary. So we use that as sort of a proxy measure on, on willingness to spend, local voters' willingness to spend on government services. And, and in particular for communities and families, et cetera. So um, it was nice to be able to use that measure and I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, before I get to the results, I wanna, um, I don't see questions. I was gonna see if there were any questions so far, um, but CB, I don't see any. Go ahead, Betty, yep. We'll just uh, take it at the very end. Okay. Um, and you remember, you can type in questions, and we'll, that's how we'll get questions um, at the end. So in terms of our results, um, I'll say more about these, but the, the, uh, clearly the unit cost for selected foundational public health services were measurable, which in and of itself was, was pretty exciting, and they vary substantially across jurisdictions, across local health department jurisdictions. So um, in looking at uh, the variation in those unit costs, they are very uh, closely related to socioeconomic factors and this political context or, or this voter sentiment um, uh, notion that we use. And, but yet, there's still a lot of unexplained variation um, that, that still exists that we weren't able to um, tease out in the study. And, you know, it's not, not surprising. It's hard to um, take all of that into account. And, of course, that'll lead to further research. Um, so let's show you a little bit about um, what the data look like. Uh, so this is looking at um, the foundational public health capabilities. Remember, there were six of them, and you see six different uh, colors in that legend at the bottom. And those are the six uh, foundational capabilities. A through J are our 10 health departments. Um, we, we gave these data, we created these uh, bar graphs, and. Um, consistently gave these data back to our local public health directors and we would say, you know, so-and-so, your health department F, um, does that look correct? And they were very eager to see how they looked um, in comparison to their uh, colleagues, et cetera, and, and how those compared. But, um, but, and the data we collected here and, and are represented here are in terms of their current costs so remember, this is, um, this is cost. So what was the actual cost to the agency for the delivery of these services? The entire cost incurred, not just in this case, what did we spend, but what were these other costs included, including indirect costs and cars and phones and things like that. Um, and this graph shows the gap between the actual costs and the funding they thought was needed. We asked them too. 
on what's the current cost and how does that compare to what you think is needed. Um, so in this, you'll see in every case, need was greater than, um, than the um, current costs uh, they were incurring. So they weren't meeting the need. Um, and here you also see that orange bar is quite big, and that's business competency. So they needed a lot of help in sort of management kind of. Um, this shows graph shows the um, actual costs around funding and need in terms of um, those uh, foundational public health services, those six service areas. And again, need is always greater than um, current funding. Um, purple tends to be quite big, that's um, maternal child health, green, environmental health. Now here it shows when, when we were able to do, like, look at unit costs. So we had some measures to be able to, that um, we matched up and combined these data, these cost data with our activities and services inventory and matched up um, uh, similar activities between the, the cost of, of delivery of activities. And here we look at, we're looking at STI contact tracing um, and a related measure of cost. And you'll see there's a huge difference between local health jurisdiction one and two. So, um, and these costs represent um, portions of FTEs used in these, around these services, specific salaries, estimated indirects. Um, this, this other bar chart we have here splits out uh, communicable disease control more broadly by population size. And this is not uh, per capita, this is just general spending. So clearly you're going to see those larger health departments at the bottom, um, G, H, and J, they have, they spend more money, they have many more cases, um, and uh, a greater population to serve around communicable disease. So this, you could say this doesn't tell us much. Um, it's just got, it meets face validity here. On the other hand, if you're a health department D up at the top and you're one of these smaller guys, they were very interested to see how how my health department D really compares to others like mine um, in those smaller public health jurisdictions. So here's um, another couple of visualizations showing, um, and here we're controlling for a population that uses per capita data, and we see a really clear trend of uh, increasing costs incurred of providing, in this case, chronic disease and injury prevention programs with increasing poverty. So the chronic disease uh, included here is screening, obesity prevention, tobacco use reduction, that kind of thing. Um, and in areas of higher poverty, and each dot represents a health department there, and um, as the, the um, percent of households in poverty increases, um, the costs incurred are higher, and the need is greater. So on the right, you see the shorter distance between the dots and the regression line for cost versus poverty shows an even stronger relationship uh, for need, um, with need than, than even current spending. And the steeper line on the right for need shows that increasing poverty has a greater effect um, than it does for current costs. So um, the two pictures here um, are the same data, and this is a capacity public health assessment cost, and shown here in two different ways. On the left, you see current and needed costs are plotted separately to show how each relates, in this case, again, to poverty. So current costs really don't show a relationship here with poverty, but needed costs increase uh, greatly with poverty. So on the left, they're probably all getting kind of the same amount of money. On the right, we see that it really doesn't. Um, it, it 
it makes a big difference in general for those for higher poverty communities. They really need more. And on the right, you see uh, population size um, as well as the magnitude of the gap between current spending. That's blue here. So current spending is the blue dot. Needed spending is the red dot. You see um, the, the blue is always lower, generally lower than the red. And um, the, small, the smaller dots are smaller um, population sizes. So it's clear that the smaller local health departments have the largest gap in this um, assessment capability. So it might be, for example, that poverty isn't driving the need as much as the lack of resources for smaller health departments. So another explanation for this variation gap is um, is it, this willingness to spend, you know, what in quotes, what we are calling willingness to spend proxy, or this this is the support for this initiative 1351. So um, uh, so this seems to be a pretty sensitive indicator. It makes sense that um, in this case that most of these trend lines are negative. In this case, we're looking at chronic disease and injury prevention again. So this tells us that in communities where voters are more willing to spend, we've seen a smaller gap between actual and needed uh, costs incurred or, or money and money spent. Um, or the bottom line is what you see here on the right is where there's more positive votes for um, for this initiative 1351 around um, um, class sizes and spending on that, reducing class size, um, there's less need for more chronic disease and injury prevention spending. So uh, the needs tend to be getting met where um, our voters are more willing to spend. And that was a, there was a strong relationship there. There's limitations. Um, the you know clearly we have to think about endogeneity here. The unit cost of a service might affect how much an, a local health jurisdiction spends on a particular activity, which in turn affects the incidence of the problem that the activity is designed to address, et cetera. So um, in our our final analysis, we are looking at um, at variables that will include to um, uh, to get rid of that. Uh, endogeneity problem. Um, so we'll be doing that. And there's differing perceptions of the instrument definitions that might occur. Um, we really worked with people to, um, to kind of re mitigate the potential for errors. Uh, in part, what we did too was we regularly examined these data and preliminary findings with our practice partners. Each of those 10 health departments, we showed them their data and, um, and asked them, if they looked right to them, et cetera. We, we had a small advisory committee um, that helped us understand what we were seeing too and the degree to which it resonated or not. And we, off, we, we saw work through some erroneous values that way um, and straightened them out. Um, and uh, so, so clear, but clearly, you know, there's the, the data aren't going to be perfect. Um, but we feel like what, that what makes this practice-based research really, as this was practice-based research, we really feel like we've got pretty high-quality data, more rigorous findings, and it made, us pos made it possible to examine these kinds of things that we would never have been able to do otherwise. Um, some of the implications here are, are that this, this cost uh, estimation instrument um, has gotten legs of its own. Uh, and uh, uh, CB, I think you and others, are, you and Glenn have been using this, and um, there's been uh, increased interest in this estimation instrument. We'll be using it further ourselves. Um, so that's been um, uh, valuable. And the data and evidence needed for educating policymakers clearly seems to be a takeaway from that, from this as well. Um, also, just the um, the data visualizations with participants, they've said a lot about um, the degree to which even just looking at these data helped to tell a story of strategy and philosophy that differs by different agencies. 
um, they've been very interested around comparing um, their own um, themselves against others, other like health departments, um, and uh, and has generated a lot of additional discussion. So I think I'm gonna. Oh, this is uh, practice applications that were generated by some of our own um, state and uh, local colleagues in terms of um, they're eager to use these these data along with um, other data in the state to help um, triangulate some of the issues and discussions they're having around the foundational public health services. Um, and uh, part of this uh, legislative ask that, that, that they're developing. And then, as I mentioned, local health jurisdictions have been really interested in um, using these data for their own comparisons. Um, so I think, I think that's the end now, and I can hand it back to you, CB. Yes, so uh, uh, thank you, Betty, for that. And before we get to our commentators, I'd just like to remind everyone to start, please, asking your questions. And actually, we can address one of the main questions right now so that you know uh, other questions can build on that. So Betty, there's been a couple of questions in the chat box asking about how was the need uh, calculated? So you have current spending, but how was the uh, need uh, spending uh, derived or estimated? Yeah, that was, um, it was really more in terms of asking, uh, you know, they carefully um, developed, you know, answer, replied to all these questions around their, um, or provided data around these different um, uh, activities and capabilities. And then in each case, we're asked basically, how much more would you need? Or how close are you to? Um, you know, or what, how much more of an FTE would you need for this or that? Um, or does this meet your need? If not, um, how much more would you need? So I think it was more about um, percent of FTE, uh, additional dollars needed if it was um, like a, more of a non-labor expense. Hopefully that answers that question. So just to confirm also what Gianfranco was asking, is it is essentially also part of the instrument, sort of part of the self-reporting by the LHJs too as well? Yes, yes. So, so that is definitely a limitation, Gianfranco, that, um, you know, that would be, uh, um, you know, we don't have any really consistent direct measure of, you know, quote, actual need. What, what, did, what does that mean? Um, at this point, we're going by, um, you know, self-report, and uh, but there was a lot of consistency, or certain amount of consistency, in some of this, um, and we did our best to get people's reflections back. If somebody was very, very different from another, like health department, we might ask them, "Is this is this really what you meant?" and and uh, and they gave us additional information about some of that. Um, so we did our best to uh, clarify that with folks, but definitely. You know, we don't have a, quote, objective measure of needs, and that would be an area, um, an area for further research or, um, or, or getting at what does that mean? How much more is enough? And why, might, uh, why does one need more than another? But that's a good question. So we'll, we'll get to the other questions later after the commentaries, and so we just want to encourage people to start typing your questions in the chat box because there is quite a lag so that we can get to those questions right out of the commentary. So it is my pleasure to introduce our uh, two commentators today. I'll first introduce them and then they'll give their commentaries one after the other. Our first commentator is Dr. Susan Zanner, who is the Associate Dean for Academic Affairs and is a Villas Distinguished Achievement Professor at the University of Wisconsin-Madison School of Nursing. She also has an affiliate appointment with the School of Medicine and Public Health. Dr. Zahner has over 30 years of professional experience in public health and nursing. She teaches graduate students and conducts research in local public health system performance, multi-sector health improvement partnerships, and public health nursing education and practice. Susan's also the co-director of the Wisconsin Public Health Practice-Based Research Network, which links public health practitioners and researchers to answer questions and disseminate results to improve practice and population health. Her other leadership positions have included serving as the chair of the Board of Health for Madison and Dane County and as chair of the Public Health Nursing Section of the American Public Health Association. Our second commentator will be Tony Smith, 
who is administrator of the Spokane Regional Health District, Washington, which is a public health accreditation board accredited health district. Corny is a member of the Washington State University's Health Policy Analysis Program Advisory, and he has also served on the FAB Standards Work Group as an accreditation reviewer. Corny is a member of the NACHO's Board of Directors and Accreditation Preparation and Quality Improvement Committee. He has co-chaired the Washington State Standards Work Group for the public health system for 13 years and is also a graduate of the Public Health Leadership Institute in Chapel Hill. So with that, I'd like to first turn it over to you, Susan. Great, thank you very much. Uh, this is a, a wonderful presentation and I really appreciate the chance to comment on it. Um, I was asked to consider the value of this research for building the PHSSR evidence base and also implications for future research. So let me talk about the value first. I think this is a really important um, type of study and an important um, category for research. As Betty mentioned, financing is highly variable and it's very useful to understand more about why that, why that is. So it's a very important topic. So thank you for that. I think secondly, um, the, the fact that this study is creating a new source of data is also very uh, important. And new, new data sources are important in this PHSSR field because data has been so limited in the past. So I, I appreciate these researchers um, creating new data about costs and services. Uh, thirdly, I think it's also important that there's been a new tool now created, this cost estimation tool. I think that's really important. And if more studies could perhaps use this tool, we could increase the amount of data that would be available on costs, which would then allow for a wider range of analytic methods and cross-state comparisons and so on. So thank you, Betty, for, for creating, adapting this tool. And I'd really like to look at it and talk to you more about maybe using it in some other ways. And then finally, I think it's really important that this is, I think, one of the earlier studies using the Foundational Public Health Services framework. Um, I don't know to what extent states and local agencies are using this model, but I think it's wonderful that Washington is and is also um, studying it. And so I, I really give you a lot of credit for doing that. With regard to implications for future research, um, I, think, I think this is a yet another study that shows the utility of conducting research in collaboration with practice partners and using a PBRN approach. The study clearly couldn't be conducted without the active engagement of those health departments. I thought, I thought the kinds of information that you're giving back to the practice partners is, is very good, and I, I'd like to take some lessons away from that myself. I think secondly, um, if you, any kind of future research in this area need to consider the limitations of this study. The small sample, 10 health departments, um, isn't, isn't very many. Uh, even though there's a lot of data, right, that comes from, from even this small sample, but to extend the data collection further and to other states, and also the issue of using um, perceptual versus observational data. Um, overall, I think unit costs are not often known or calculated in health departments, and even if known, they may be calculated differently across health departments within a state and certainly across states. But these researchers uh, have, have shown that it's possible to apply a standard methodology to calculating those unit costs. So I think we really, it would really benefit us in, for future researchers to use the same or similar cost calculation. I, I think another item is that, um, that like other PHSSR studies, this one depends on perceptions of needed expenditures versus actual expenditures. And until we have some uniform reporting and cost accounting system work across health departments on the practice side or, or even the research side, I think we're going to continue to have this challenge. And then the final thing I'll just mention is the, the idea of the unexplained variation. Um, researchers like to use the same variables that other researchers have used to help explain things because that builds a body of knowledge. But we clearly aren't explaining all of the, the unexplained variation and won't unless we start using a variety of different variables um, to study that. So I guess we keep trying and we keep 
uh, I think we need to look uh, maybe even more to practice for ideas about so what what should be we be putting into these models? What additional variables should be we, should we be looking at to try to explain more of this? So congratulations, Betty and your colleagues and Justin and on the great study and good luck with it um, going forward. Thank you, Susan. And we turn it over to you, Tarney. Great, thank you very much. And Susan, uh, appreciated your comments. Um, and we'll link a few things from a local health jurisdiction practice perspective. Um, first of all, this was an incredibly useful exercise for us as a local health jurisdiction. I think the inquisitiveness that um, came along with this from the researchers uh, really caused us to look a lot more specifically at some of the challenges on the questions that have been raised, such as the one around need. Uh, but let me start by just saying uh, some of the challenges that I think we face across the state in trying to do this measurement is the um, inconsistency in size, structure, population served capacity of each of these agencies. And so what Betty and Justin were trying to accomplish was really an understanding of the system by capturing measurements from a variety of those of us within the system who differ sig significantly. Uh, I think the other major challenge in this work is that we have a budget and accounting reporting system called BARS in Washington State, and that's what all of us as local health jurisdictions report our costs against. So for internal tracking of data, we are capturing the data based on our BARS reporting requirements. It's important to recognize that the BARS definitions are nowhere close to being what the new foundational capabilities and programs definitions are. So there was interpretation required when we looked at any one of the capabilities or programs, and we tried to go through and look very specifically at the detailed definitions and then split out what we know our staff does, then have to look at it as we capture the data from the BARS system and interpolate that into what component or what amount of that really applies to the expenditure that we're using as it would be defined uh, in the Foundational Public Health Service definition. I am certain that interpretation was done differently. Uh -huh. uh, additionally, when you look at the size and capability of different departments, uh, there are several departments that are very small. They may not even have the capability to have an assessment component. It might be one-tenth of what a public health nurse does, where in my agency, I have a half a dozen people who work in that unit who specifically are doing that research. For Betty, or just to try and capture the differences there and have meaningful unit cost, I think is very challenging. Additionally, I think um, when you talk about need, uh, and Jim Franco, I think your question is an interesting one because it challenged all of us to talk about issues around what is our capacity, on my example with assessment, from an agency that has none that says what is the need versus me who has a half a dozen, um, it talks about what in foundational public health services exploration and modeling says that we will change the way the system functions in our state. So will we have regionalization or shared services? Being a home rule state, there's a whole lot of political pieces that play into that. But part of the challenge of capturing meaningful and accurate data is an assumption about if we do foundational public health services, will I have a broader capacity responsibility to, to my neighboring counties, or do they want it? So those make the, the black and white get very gray. I think additionally where I have the opportunity because of the size of my staff to have full FTE FTEs that do specific work compared to a smaller agency that may have one individual whose FTE is divided amongst those pieces of work adds a complexity to that interpretation. Um, 
I think the other piece that has really been of value out of this work, in addition to gaining the data that Betty has been able to present back to us, but we are working in parallel with another organization trying to understand what do we think the costs are that we can take to our legislature to do foundational public health services. So having a comparison between the two methodologies is very useful. And finally, I would say it has really driven some good dialogue around the need to redesign the chart of accounts for public health, at least within the state, if not nationally so that we can much better capture an accurate uh, determination of what are the services or uh, skills that we really need to pay for. So that would be my comment. Thank you very much, Tony. Thank you very much, Susan, for those excellent commentaries. And so we would, before we open it again, uh, again, we're uh, encouraging everyone to start typing in their questions in the chat box since there is a lag and we're hoping to get as much as uh, the questions that we can with the time that we have remaining. But uh, we'd like to turn it back first over to you, uh, Betty, for your comments on the uh, commentaries. Uh, thank you, Susan and Torni. It, this is great. The, um, yeah, a couple of things jumped out at me in terms of like the unexplained variation. Uh, clearly, there are more things that need to go into these models as we look at this. And um, but it was it was really interesting to um, to add this political the um, political piece. Um, I myself was a little tentative about that initially because you know we we thought as researchers that might play out. But um, I was also um, this being really practice based research. I wanted to do what was going to. Um, help my practice partners and I was less certain that, that um, uh, if that really played out in a big way how that would be helpful or perhaps a hindrance or, or but this was really this really came from our practice partners that said no no um, we that's a big piece of it we should include it we need to be able to understand how that plays into what we do so um, and then we uh, sought out this variable so that was a really uh, kind of um, uh, iterative approach to uh, figuring out what we wanted to include in our models and it really played out and was driven a lot by our practice partners. Um, but, uh, but it will be a while before we really understand how else, what else uh, needs to go into um, uh, understanding how these uh, services ought to be costed out, but at the same time, the pressure's on for for us in Washington. I know, um, as we develop this, uh, this as our colleagues develop this ask. Um, so uh, um, anyway, I think I won't take up any more time because it seems like there's a lot of questions there. No problem, Betty. So uh, I guess to start off the discussion, uh, building on what you're talking about, the political component of the analysis. Uh, sort of what was the thinking that went into uh, choosing Initiative 1351 as a proxy for political inclinations? If you could just speak a little more to that, I mean, that would be okay. helpful. And and this is where we had the advantage of um, of having Justin Marlowe, who is, he, he doesn't come from public health. He is, his area of research is local government financing, and he's in our school public administration. Um, so he is a quick learner. He is um, has learned a lot about public health, uh, you know, participating with our team in the last couple of years. But um, but he knows a lot about uh, Washington State and elsewhere in terms of of how to um, uh, look at this. And his sense, his strong sense of Washington was about um, that we really do have, and he has evidence for this around some really fiscally conservative Democrats. Um, in terms of our populations and some spendthrift Republicans. So um, so that was really his idea around this initiative, uh, in our case, 1351. Um, and, and I think it was a good one. It seemed really sensitive to this um, notion, to these data and to this notion of, of kind of this willingness to spend notion. You know, unfortunately, um, for, uh, 
and for others of you in other states where you don't have this initiative process, um, in part I think you're lucky. <laughs> but but uh, for us, those were some valuable um, uh, data in this case and seem pretty sensitive. Thanks, Betty. So now we'll run through some of the questions that were in the chat box and, and have you comment on them. Uh, I guess one was from the first one, it's a, I guess, a thread about, uh, from Jessica from slide 15 and Patricia about this particular health department, LHJ, where the current spending on assessment seems to be slightly higher than the need. And it looks like uh, Jesse comments that LHAJOA was pretty high in the current and need for capabilities relative to other LHJs, but relatively low compared to other LHJs on the program. So I wonder if that reflects different perspectives on how to allocate costs. So for example, this assessment related to chronic disease count as a capability or program. So would you like to comment on a little about how these different capabilities or programs were varying across the different LHJs? Would that reflect the uh, LHJ's, you know, um, I guess, value or priority for each program? I don't, I don't know. So go ahead, Betty, and, and, yeah. and see how you'd like to comment on that. I, I might ask Torney to jump in here, too. But I do think, um, you know, it is a lot about, and, and I've heard that from my uh, public health colleagues, too, that this represents, or our local health jurisdiction colleagues, that this does represent a certain, some different philosophies around these agencies, to what extent, um, are they really um, putting more effort and energy into assessment or not? Um, and there is a certain amount of, uh, there's something that's not included here, but we are doing um, some additional research in this area and collecting data in this area in, in terms of a separate study. But um, part of what this might reflect is um, there's a certain amount of uh, cross-jurisdictional sharing going on and perhaps uh, in and around these capabilities that reflects um, my agency doesn't need more because I'm getting some of these services or, or collaborating with my um, partners uh, across the border in terms of helping out in this area. And I don't know if you want to add, um, you're on the ground there, Torney, in terms of what this might reflect too. Well, I would agree exactly with what you have said. I think there are circumstances where a county who might have a part-time assessment person uh, who also is their public health nurse who also is working environmental public health because they're only an agency of say 10 people um, they might find that under a different model structure Spokane could easily provide that capability for them and therefore it would reduce their future need mm -hmm. um, I think also that um, that if you look at the spending that is done on assessment being higher than the need, it would simply be that, that exact situation where you have somebody in that role now that would not be needed in the future. We, um, we presented this, these findings just last week at the Washington State Public Health Association conference, and it was gratifying to hear from folks that you know, the question came up around could some of this reflect cross-jurisdictional sharing and we need to know more about that and what creates efficiencies, et cetera. It was gratifying to hear that because it's something we're working on right now. <laughs> so, um, that's But I think that is one, Betty, one of the confounding factors that is, question, that is asked about in some of these questions is that there are fears that happen when you talk about regionalization or shared services, um, just job security fears from smaller counties who think somebody's going to take over their job. I don't know how that correlates to the responses that they then give about need. Yeah, good point. Good point, Tony. That, that sort of also answers uh, Jason Orr's question about do you have any suspicions on what confounding variables may be present to contribute to the unexplained variation? So that's another thing to consider is this regionalization and cross-jurisdictional um, functions that are also ongoing. Uh, Phyllis comments that it would be a great service to LHDs to help them estimate the level of need. So if that's something you guys might be considering if when you expand, if ever there's plans in the future to, to uh, expand the use of the instrument, how, you know, to get to estimating that need um, is something that would, 
would help too if you can document that. Uh, Gianfranco comments, I think that work on standardizing the definitions of programs, capabilities and services could help reduce the variability in the perception of the need. The work that has been done through FAST Improve is an example. Now when we ask do you have a tobacco control program, for example, we can all refer to the definition of that program and its components removing much of the guess and variability from the interpretation of that question. So I guess related to that, Betty, was there a, I guess, a definitions guide that was provided to your respondents, to the LHJ respondents, uh, yes. when they were asked these questions? Yes, definitely. That was, um, we had a lot of instructions. Uh, the, the participants went very carefully through these instructions, definitions around everything. Um, and then we had our research assistant who was Johnny on the spot in terms of answering questions and doing everything she could to help people kind of use similar definitions. But all that being said, people are still going to have um, slightly different interpretations. And let me add to that, Betty, if I may. Um, there was also a question that was asking about uh, like an assessment of chronic disease. Does that fall under assessment as a capacity or under a program? And those were the very specific definitions that were given to us. It does fall under capacity. But if you go to a local health jurisdiction, one of the smaller ones, again, where one person has multiple duties, one of which is incommunicable disease and one of which is doing their assessment work, their interpretation of how you divide that person's time up is much more challenging than for me who have distinct staff that do those different components. Excellent point, and I think that also speaks to, you know, the challenges that you guys faced in, in collecting this data. So um, I'm sure that many people had also other questions. We've had a good number of participants this afternoon, and so please don't forget you can direct these questions either directly to Betty and the Washington PBRN um, research team, or you can also course it through us. Oh, actually, we can have, I think, a few more minutes for one more question. Jillian asks, how closely were you able to define a unit as size capacity varies? Was there variation in, for example, SCD contact follow-up? So I guess your unit was per capita essentially, right, uh, Betty? Yes. Um, so say, what's the question again? How closely were you able to define a unit? Um, yeah, and that depended, you know, the, that was another issue in terms of having service delivery measures that really fit with the foundational um, public health services and capabilities. So all of our, our measures are not organized, our, our BARS <laughs> reporting, our expenditure reporting is not organized around the foundational public health services, neither are, neither are our services. So so we had, we just made the judgment in terms of carefully aligning in a few cases, a few things that seem to meet those same definitions of a foundational public health service um, and a, and a subcategory of that and then um, played around with some activity measures. So in that um, example with STIs, we felt like that um, the definition for um, that service and, and how it's defined in the activities and services inventory was closely aligned with um, how we define that in the Foundational Public Health Services. Excellent, excellent. So thank you so much, uh, Betty. Thank you so much, Susan. Thank you so much, Turney. We, we really appreciate this excellent presentation. We thank you, everyone, for uh, being part of this uh, webinar. And uh, again, feel free to direct your questions if you have additional questions about the Foundational Public Health Services cost estimation work that Betty's doing out of Washington with Justin Marlowe. You can also uh, course your questions as well through the S4A uh, National Program Office here at Lexington. And we want to remind everyone also about our upcoming webinars uh, on November 4 and December 2. So please take note. And again, if you also want to get a copy of this webinar, uh, a presentation of this webinar, also past webinars, these are all available for download from our website. So with that, I'd like to thank everyone once again. Thank you, Betty. Uh, thank you, Susan. Thank you, Tony. And we hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you for joining us.